Welcome back to The In Chamber. I'm your host, Tom Schumann. I say welcome back to those who are regular listeners or have tuned in for any of our previous now 63 episodes. If this is your first time listening to The In Chamber, you're in for a treat. Today, and for the two subsequent episodes this March, we are joined by leaders of some of the top colleges and universities in Indiana. We enjoyed some wonderful conversations during a similar feature in season one in early 2018. Our biggest challenge probably will be finding enough time to tackle some of the many topics that are so prevalent today in the world of higher education. With that said, let's introduce today's guest. She began her tenure as the 12th president of Indiana State University in January 2018. Earlier, she had earned her PhD from from ISU. We'll talk about that a little bit. Dr. Deborah Curtis, welcome to the In Chamber. Tom, thank you. It's it's an honor to be here. So I mentioned you earned your your doctorate degree from ISU. You spent 26 years at Illinois State, uh, other stops on your education trail. Did you ever think you would come back to Terre Haute and Indiana State University? Actually, no, I did not. And when the opportunity presented itself, I said, who gets that chance to come back to the place that gave you your start and lead? So it's just been a real thrill to be back at Indiana State. So a university president in the year 2020, the, uh, the responsibilities, the roles, the, the opportunities are so numerous. Talk about your priorities. What's the number one focus for you as, as Indiana State president? I'm going to tell you they're number 1A, 1B, and 1C because these are the three initiatives since I arrived, but definitely going forward as we're building a new strategic plan, we're focused on. Number 1A, if you will, is enrollment. We all have to focus on enrollment right now. But it's a pivot for us in taking a look at how do we serve some of those Hoosiers with some college and no degree. They're not likely to come live in a dorm in Terre Haute, so how do we reach out? And big thanks to the state of Indiana for our renovation that starts this year on Dreiser Hall because that's the home of our distance education classrooms. So that's the one A piece. One B is communication. I find very much moving around the state as president when you get further away from Terre Haute, people know less about your university and the comprehensive institution it has become over these 150 years. So communication is a key piece. And then the 1C is fundraising, which we're all about doing right now. But Indiana State has lagged a bit behind. So we're heavily engaged in some studies about where we go next with our fundraising and encouraging our alumni and friends to invest in helping students graduate. Let's talk about that enrollment piece a little bit. What, what is the, uh, is there an ideal enrollment for Indiana State? What a number that makes sense? And, and, and again, how's that change a little bit over the years with, with the way education's evolving? When we take a look at our campus and the, the right number for our campus, uh, that leaves out this other pivot we're talking about, about serving students at, at distance. So we're about 12,000 right now. I think we could comfortably be 14 or 15,000 before we'd need to consider any kind of building on campus. We've just renovated all our freshman dorms and their dining facility. We're actually going to take down an older uh, dorm facility now that those uh, renovated ones are back online. So I think for us, 14 to 15 is right, but then you would add into that mix how we're able to reach out not only in Indiana, that's our primary mission though, but beyond Indiana with some of our distinctive programs. So that distance learning aspect that you mentioned, isn't that an area that is just extremely competitive, even more competitive maybe than attracting the t t traditional freshman student? Well, it truly is. There are a lot of very large uh, entities out there in the market that seem to be capturing a lot. I keep returning with our team to talk about our distinctive programs. Uh, we won't be everything to everybody, and there are entities out there that are doing that and engaging, but we have some unique programs that certainly are a need for the state of Indiana, but as well nationally, uh, that we really believe could be better accessed online. Uh, one example would be something like construction management. We have fine faculty and staff there. We have an online program, and we find that highly enrolled 
and able to grow at its capacity. The RN to BSN online is huge for us. We have 500 students in that program. Uh, people who earned an RN in nursing and realize most medical facilities are moving to an expectation of a BSN, so they're able to come online with us. We're pretty affordable as well, and that's an important piece to our marketing. And there are at least uh, two or three more that we're gonna be pushing quickly as we move forward. Well, as you mentioned those programs, is that where the communication part comes in? I mean, you're, you're having success with those programs, but you communicate even more to take them to a higher level? Is that a fair assessment? That is, but it's also how you're communicating. You know, I usually make a reference broadly on a campus about billboards, you know, billboards here and there. Well, that's not where people get most of their information today. So our online marketing piece has really uh, been invested in recently and we're engaging in growth in that area. That's where students go to take a look at what's available to them, who meets their needs. I always say to my colleagues, online learners want to know three things. How long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? And you're going to deliver it in a way that works for me. That's, of course, moving aside that we're highly accredited in most of these areas as well because students hunt for that as well. So we're really working carefully at giving students that picture. How long will it take? What's it going to cost? And how will it be delivered in a way that's manageable for them? That they can say, I can take a hold of this because I can see what that looks like and I'm ready to move forward. We keep hearing that from businesses uh, and, and employees, you know, ones that are considering going back. <clears throat> exactly what you said. What does it mean for me? And, and that, that, and that length period, that time period also. We talked about uh, a little bit about the students going back. What about the, the, eight, the typical 18 year old now? Again, for many years, it was, that was the core audience, the 18 year old getting ready to go live on campus for four years. Is that now almost the minority uh, scenario? I'm not too sure we're at a point where it's a minority. We're moving in a direction where folks are looking for the accessibility of being able to take courses online, but I don't think the residential campus will ever go away. And here's why I say that. When we take a look at either career changers who go to look at a baccalaureate degree because they don't have one, or folks who are out in the work field saying, I could move forward in my current job, They've already been out in the world. They've had the socialization experiences they need, and they're really looking for the content. I need the content. What a residential campus provides to that traditional 17, 18 year old walking in the door is that ability to not only pick up the content in the field in which they want to work, but also just grow as an individual who's ready to go into the workplace. So we focus a lot on career ready skills for all of our students. That's the environment in which most 18 year olds are best in, in uh, brought into what do you what do you do on campus to adapt to their changing expectations I'm sure again that go back to me at Ball State 35 plus years ago and you know there were certain expectations I had but I'm, it's so different today I imagine what students want out of that residential experience well I will tell you I, I joke a bit mine goes back a little bit longer <laughs> even than yours where I say to students, you know, when I went to college, the food was brown, it was warm, eat it or not. That's not the kind of dining experience they expect today. And this recent renovation of our dining facilities is testimony to that. I mean, you can walk through and it's like a food court, a little higher end than the, the fast food type of food court. They look for that and they compare those things when they visit campuses. Uh, the other piece for us in the renovation of our uh, housing is they look for sweet style living. They don't want to go to a restroom down the hallway. They really want to have that opportunity to have a more living room like environment. So uh, that's who you're competing with, with institutions to do that. I'll often hear people talk about, do you have a climbing wall and, and eye rolling? Well, students look for those things. We have a wonderful rec center. Uh, that was built uh, n not too many years ago um, in the t t uh, 2010s, 12s. And that has become almost the gathering place that the student union used to be. You're likely to find more students in the rec center than you are in the student union. So it's a, it's a mixture of those opportunities, but also Indiana State has a focus on community engagement. So we call it a parallel curriculum. They're not only preparing in a field, but we believe it's our responsibility to teach them how to be contributing citizens, no matter what community they end up in uh, when they graduate. 
You know, Dr. Curtis, one of the things you mentioned for whether it's a returning student or anything is, is the cost factor. It really applies to anybody. Uh, when we look at student debt, we, we, many people have seen the numbers, the, the trillions of dollars out there in student debt. What's the university reaction? What are some of the things that, that you focus on to try to help alleviate that? Well, we'll start by saying it's no accident that among the four big publics, we are the most affordable. We work to stay there. So any considerations about raising tuition and fees is, is very carefully studied. I'll, I'll start with that. But another piece that we found pretty good success with is the appropriate type of financial advising to students. We just, as a matter of fact, right now, revised even our financial aid notification letters to students coming that make it much clearer. Here's what you qualify for from us. Here's what you qualify for from the federal government in the way of assistance. Here's the cost of attendance. Here's the difference. People refer to that as the EFC, the expected family contribution. So it's straight up front. Also the advisement with students and their families, you may qualify for more loans than you need. Do not take all of those loans because sometimes we see that with first generation college goers. Oh, well I can take that much in a loan, I'll take that and it's not needed. So it's, it's really being very careful in advising students about exactly what you need to complete this degree and not borrowing any more than yeah. that. <clears throat> it's education experience for students and families it I is. assume in some cases. It is. You mentioned a few of the programs. Talk about some others at Indiana State, some, some kind of niche niches maybe where the university really stands out and some specific things to help uh, businesses fill the important needs. Well, I have my favorite one since I've been back to Indiana State, and you'll understand why when I describe it. Engineering Package Technology. And in this program, it's a nationally accredited program. The interesting part is we're the only institution nationally accredited in this program. When our students graduate, it's 100% employment and the employers say we need more of them. And what I keep saying at the leadership table is, who knows, we have that, back to the communication piece. Uh, but we just drawn the attention of ESCO, which is a, a company that provides the software for this package engineering technology program, who's over the years, recent years, provide us with about $600,000 worth of uh, software to help us train. Well, recently, as communication, we brought them to campus and let them look at our program and said, oh, we're doubling that. So just this year, a $1.2 million investment Excellent. because they know the need in the field. And uh, chatting with my colleagues at other institutions in Indiana, I'll often get a, well, we don't have that program. No, you don't. It's We're the only one in the state of Indiana that has that program. Back again to who knew that? Who knows that? So communicating that, that it's 100% employment, it's very, very cool technology. You know, all this Amazon boom and all, somebody's got to design the packaging that gets that product to me without it being broken, even though some of those clamshell cases are a challenge for me to open <laughs> up. But that's what they do, that's what they study, that's what they develop. I often say with our roots as a teacher education institution, we still prepare many, many teachers and they do very well in the field. But people are surprised to hear our largest undergraduate major is criminology. We have police officers, uh, state police and community police departments all over the state of Indiana who graduated from Indiana State. And those colleagues out there often look for what's their next step as a first responder. Well, it's often chief. Well, what graduate programs do we have to offer to them? Usually it's a, it's a master's in public administration because that's a different world than they studied when they're doing their criminology work. So that's an area that we believe is, I keep using the term, our wheelhouse. Then we have several, a, list, a long list of pre-programs. So we have pre-med, we've got pre-law, we have pre-veterinary, I think there are about eight of them. We have pre-physical therapy, we have pre-occupational therapy. I'm going to stop at that before because if I leave several off, I won't get in trouble with yeah, we just don't wanna, one person. We don't want to get you in trouble. But but now more people know about the, the packaging just by talking about it today. That's and true. as you said, through various other communications efforts. Well, our safety sciences program is, is another one where graduates are sought after. And many first generation college students come into college and don't even know what that is. And then they take a course perhaps in their general education activities and say, I really like that, and then switch their majors while they're there, so we find that growing. We have an unusual, for this state, insurance and risk management major in our College of Business. Once again, really high employment rate of our graduates from that program. 
a, a number of years ago, the early 2000s, before you were back in, in Indiana, there was a, a state, the state did a study of the higher education institutions and kind of looked at how they fit together as a system. Kevin Berninger, our president, as I recall, was on that commission. We did some communications around it. So the question is, is when you, obviously you're at Indiana State, you're looking uh, to make that university the absolute best it can be. How do you look at the, the university system as a whole? Does Indiana State fit into certain areas or do, do you, is it competing against other institutions for those students? Indiana State is certainly a comprehensive university like several other the publics in the state. But what I keep messaging since I've been back is we have a distinctive mission in the state. Now I'll, I'll say why I, I believe it's distinctive. Some of these programs I mentioned you won't find at some of the other institutions. And I usually describe that as a, an applied professional mission. These are folks that are studying in a field where they're going to have a great deal of hands-on activity. So several of our engineering programs are engineering tech that provide the hands-on piece for that work. So that's one piece that I think is a distinctive to Indiana State. And I, I say this regularly, Indiana State is the state of Indiana's university. 70% of our students come from Indiana, 70% stay. I almost tripped on that one because I want to say last fall's freshman class 77 percent were from indiana so we don't have as much of the brain drain as some of the others do and there's a reason that's their mission their mission is to spread people beyond indiana mm -hmm. and around the world our mission is to serve the workforce needs of the state of indiana and we do that very well i think another piece in in that's really that question is you can't pick up a magazine about economics and not see the dwindling middle class language in our country right now. Well, what we do is fill the middle class. So our grads uh, start beginning salaries are about $47,000, $48,000 a year. For some of those first gen students, that's a big step up from where their family is, and that's beginning salary. Many of those fields will take them well beyond that. So I always consider it a transformational mission focused on the workforce needs of the state of Indiana. Talk about filling those workforce needs. Takes a partnership, takes business, takes education. Are both sides doing enough? Or are there additional things that can be done to, to, to do even more and, and more effective partnerships? You know, Tom, there are many businesses that invest a great deal of money in the training of onboarding employees. And it's my belief if there were a greater relationship between those higher ed institutions ready and willing to work with those employers, some of that burden can be taken off the employer with their willingness to engage with us. And what does that mean? It means some internship opportunities. It's a win-win for both sides. The university gives hands-on experience to its students, but the employer gets a first look. They get to see everybody who's coming out Maybe they've got some proprietary software. They get to see how that person can handle that. They can see how they work in teams. Those are the kind of relationships we're trying to build on. So we've just had a, a partnership developed with FedEx recently, $500,000 over the next five years in scholarships for professional pilot training. That's another surprise to people, but we've had aviation and pro-pilot training for quite a while at Indiana State, and I would add probably the most affordable one at the Publix in the state of Indiana. But FedEx needs pilots. So they've joined in a partnership with us for scholarships and they are engaging in interaction with those young men and women who earn those scholarships to encourage them to move on and eventually fly for FedEx. Well, I can add a couple more to your list. I know we've done several items in our Biz Voice magazine over the years on drone, drone programming. On man system. Mm -hmm. on, and uh, we were actually working on a story that'll be in the, in the March, April. This is more of a, of a unique offering, the Survey of Popular Music course, we, we've highlighted a little bit as an offering for, for students. That's something that's a little bit different. Well, and I'm gonna stay on the music a minute. As a matter of fact, we talk about workforce needs. Of course, we have all the full array of music majors, but one that's particularly unique, I think, is you can do a music major with a business administration or a merchandising co-major. We're not seeing that other places, that those students who want to get into the business side of the industry of music can come and earn that degree in the state. And it, what I hear you saying, it sounds like that's even bigger part of the future of higher education is meeting those very specific needs. Absolutely. If we don't, we're going to come across a time where we're going to have an even more exacerbated talent development problem. 
Uh, I'm just delighted to be back in Indiana. The state of Indiana is doing much better in supporting higher ed and being able to engage in these innovative programs, if you will, and connect to what the state's needs are. Uh, our capital improvements on campus, I just talked about the dorms and the dining hall, but uh, we've had $400 million worth of capital improvement over the last 10 years, most of those dollars from the state of Indiana. It's not happening everywhere right now, which allows us, back to the fundraising, to focus on raising dollars for scholarships to get those students into these high need programs and what I call across the stage crossing that stage, we are now pivoting from counting how many heads come in the door to how many feet cross the stage. The 77%, you mentioned the freshman class this year from Indiana, does that does that evolve naturally? Is there a target you're shooting for as compared to in-state, compared to out-of-state? How does that end result take place? Well, the fact that we sit on that west state line in the state means that we do some recruiting into Illinois, and mostly when you take a look at a heat map of our students who come, it's pretty much up and down that, that eastern uh, side of Illinois when we recruit there. But our major focus is on recruiting in Indiana. Uh, that's our, our plan. That's our purpose. Uh, so success builds success. When you have students who start a, a pathway to go to Indiana State from an institution and we make use of that, we send them home to talk to their peers about the experience they're having at Indiana State, it grows and it grows that presence. So I started off talking about the many responsibilities, roles of a university president. How do you juggle all that personally? How do, how do you uh, allow and create time for all the many things that you have to do in your role? When I came to Indiana State two years ago, I, I saw the challenges that were in front of us, and I mentioned some of those in the three areas of focus. So I determined that that's where I would spend my time, which meant someone else had to spend their time focusing on many of the things that impact on campus, and that's the provost. That was the experience I had as a provost. My president entrusted me with a, a bigger portfolio of responsibility so he could do that work. I've done that since I came. So our provost, Mike Lacari, now not only has the academic side of the house, but now he has enrollment management added to his responsibilities. So they have the, the complete 360 degree view of student life on campus and his ability to work with me and that relationship is key because it allows me to go out and be this external voice and he's lifting up the internal voice. What's the absolute favorite thing about being president of Indiana State University? Oh, that's an easy one two days a year commencement. <laughs> There's no bigger thrill than to reach my hand out and shake hands with young people who have accomplished what they came to do. And you'll hear eruptions out in the, uh, in the seating. And you know what that means? Because we were a stole for our first generation students. At graduation, it says first generation. So when I'm shaking hand, I know that's a first gen. And hearing those families erupt, I know what that means. It changes the whole family's perspective and expectations for not only that student's peers in the family, but future generations. Commencement is my absolute favorite time of the year. What have you heard, if you could share from some of those students, what, what do they either tell you as they're shaking your hand or maybe it's a note that you get later or are there a couple examples you can give of uh, impact that you felt from those students? Well, Tom, interestingly enough, we've decided to not just rest with the one-on-ones that come in. We've been capturing video. When a student reaches out and I say, there's a voice to go capture, we'll usually sit them down when we can get them either to come back as an alum or before they're going out the door and capture some video messaging from them. The recurring themes we hear from them is, this experience changed my life. Well, that's what we're there to do. That's why I love higher ed. It's a transformational experience for uh, young people. They're not only growing in their knowledge of something, they're growing as, as adults and contributing members of society. So we capture these in about 30 minute segments and then whittle them down for different purposes. But every time I go out now and present uh, to alumni groups, to uh, business exec, whomever, I, I call it my bookends. I always start with a student video and always end. Sometimes I'll end with an alum video, uh, especially some of these recent alums who are so excited about where life has taken them and they always point back to their experiences at Indiana State. So that's part of that communication focus right there. Absolutely. Capturing it through video. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Testimonials are mm -hmm. tremendous. Mm -hmm. um, 
so we've talked about some some challenges in higher education. You, you're obviously very upbeat on many of the possibilities. When you when you look at the two together, at the end of the day, are you more are you more positive about where things can go and headed, or do the things the, the potential challenges keep you awake at night at all? There's a little bit of both. This kind of job, you're very often awake at night, and it's not worry. It's churning, churning, churning. Uh, the other thing I noticed when I returned uh, to Indiana State all those years later is we're not promising people what we're going to do. We're lifting up what we're already doing. You know, there, there has not been enough communication about great things happening. We've got all the raw materials we need to be able to not only maintain that role as the state's university, but grow it. And it's helping people understand beyond Terre Haute this is a real opportunity at Indiana State that makes a difference in Indiana. So that's the exciting part to me and, and marshalling my colleagues on campus, which I'm thrilled to say too, I've been delighted to interact with faculty since I've been back who get that that's our, not only our set of assets, but our ability to push this university forward. So that's what we're about. You mentioned before we got started as we were <clears throat> walking back here talking about uh, the, the thinking of new ideas, you know, staying busy and, and, and uh, but coming up with new ideas. Uh, describe that a little bit, how, how, again, how you balance that out of, you keep your focus on the areas it needs to be focused, but you're always looking for that next big thing also. Well, we certainly are, and in those three areas of enrollment and communication and, and fundraising, they're really linked all the way through. So you might be working on something that you're thinking is related to foundation work, but then it offers another opportunity for communication. And by the way, it goes back to in impacting enrollment. So it's no matter which of those two, three pieces you're in, it always points to the others as well. So it's getting the team together. And that's what we're about to do, by the way, this, this fall is to start our next strategic plan. And what I've said to my colleagues is I want to plan that if it doesn't have our name on it, someone reads it and says, that's Indiana State. So that's what we're working on right now. That's a wonderful opportunity to pick out not only our distinctiveness, but gather with our colleagues to push out for the awareness throughout this state and this, this region, actually, the distinctive pieces that matter at Indiana State. Yeah. So you got three buckets that are intersecting, all, all affecting each other. has to be that way. Um, Excuse me. When you um, think about what makes a great day, you've talked about commencement and how important that is. But as university president, at the end of the day, what's made it a really successful period of time for you? So it's simply tipping the needle. It might be in one of those areas. It might be in an individual student's life on campus. It might be in a faculty member's experience tipping the needle towards the positive. If we've had a day with one, two, or when you're really lucky, three of those types of events, you just want to keep going. You don't want to let people go home at five o'clock. Let's keep doing this today. I'm usually the only one saying that, but <laughs> let's keep doing this. It gets you excited to get up and come back the next day. So it's it's moving people forward because of course we think about faculty as well. They're That's our best asset at Indiana State. They're phenomenal scholars teachers, and particularly what I call navigators for our students. They serve in so many ways of encouragement, not just while they're here with us, but career encouragement uh, for our students, that for me to be able to be in a situation where we have some of those faculty get greater attention for what they're doing, because they love being at Indiana State. It's important, 75% of an undergraduate's coursework at Indiana State is taught by a faculty member with a terminal degree. That doesn't happen in a lot of other places in undergraduate work. And that's why some faculty stay, and I've got to bring her name up. So we have a, an associate professor, Joy O'Keefe, People don't know this sometimes. We have a bat center at Indiana State University, and she runs the bat center. She I, also I did brings. Know that, did you see? I great. was aware of it. So the communication communication is working. But Joy, the interesting part about her, and I talk to incoming students and their families about people like Dr. O'Keefe. At many other institutions, because of the research she does in her labs, uh, she and the grant dollars she brings in, she might likely be not teaching as many undergrad courses and probably mostly graduates. She insists on teaching Biology 101. 
She wants to be in there when they come in the door to talk about biology. And when I first came back, I sat in her classroom, came back to the office, I said, man, I might have been a biology major if I'd had Dr. O'Keefe. That's what you need at a place like ours, that, that really fine faculty member who's really deep in her research wants these undergraduates in it because that gives them the image of, I'm going to graduate school, I want to do more of this. And they capture her enthusiasm and passion for what she's doing. And Joy's one example. We have many, many faculty at Indiana State like that. Do you miss being in the classroom at all? I get that question and the answer is <laughs> always the same, every day every day. If I have a meeting in an academic building, I'll often pause outside of a classroom just to kind of soak up some of the interaction. Uh, we, we move through these careers in different ways where you find new and different ways to contribute, but I often say about missing teaching. It filled me up as much as I thought it contributed something to the learners, and it's a different kind of filling up. You know, it was a give and a take. Uh, these roles are different than that, so I every now and then love to hang around, just watch something and, and see how that's going. Well, you know, you're in charge. You could kind of like go back in the classroom sometime, maybe guest, guest lecture or something. Sometimes that happens. I get invited. Very often it's for graduate classes to talk about higher ed leadership, things mm -hmm. of that type. But I sure loved sitting in that beginning biology course and watching her work her magic. Absolutely. We've talked about the many roles, responsibilities, things that keep a university president busy, but in any spare time that you have, what are some things you like to enjoy uh, outside of Indiana State University? Well, every now and then I'll do a podcast for the Indiana <laughs> Chamber. Well, that's excellent. In actuality, we have five grown children and nine grandchildren. That's what I do with any time we can grasp is go spend time with family. You know, for grandkids raging in age from nine to 24, they keep you grounded really well. So that's always a delight for us to do that. Excellent. Uh, and I'll open it up to you. Any final comments? Anything that we haven't talked about that you'd like to emphasize? Well, because of my new role with the Chamber, I'm really excited to start conversations with business and industry leaders to talk about how can we work together, particularly for the state of Indiana, to move our workforce forward in a way that is future resilient. As careers and fields change, how do we continue to insert education at the right time for the individual in their preparation? As I mentioned earlier, they're not likely at all come trotting over to Terre Haute and sit down and do that. How do we deliver what they need at the right time? So those conversations about graduate education, badges, credentials, worthwhile credentials that enhance the, the workspace for business leaders in, in what they need next. What's next for you and your, how can we provide that? I'm excited for that. You know, I think place. there's more conversations today than there were two years ago and there's there more are. than there were five years ago, but there still need to be add on to that, add some multiples on to those conversations. Is that a fair assessment? It absolutely is and, and a respect between one another. We know you have needs going both ways, but also we have something to offer. So we're delighted when we have uh, industry and business folks sit on our advisory boards uh, and opportunities such as that to help us stay on top, but also for us to be able to push into the field and say, what do you need, employer? What do you need? Let's see if we have the expertise to help you do that. Dr. Deborah Curtis, President of Indiana State University, thanks so much for joining us on The In Chamber. Tom, it's my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Uh, you can learn much more about Indiana State University and some of the programs that Dr. Curtis talked about at uh, indianastate.edu. We'll include that link in the, in the information with this episode. Uh, a reminder about our March-April Biz Voice magazine focused on outstanding talent, education, workforce initiatives throughout the state. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is the first of three episodes with university presidents. We'll be talking with Gregory Hess, president of Wabash College, as well as Ron Roshan of the University of Southern Indiana. So we look forward to those in the next two episodes. Thank you, as always, for listening to The In Chamber. <laughs>